Hi, welcome to the spring 2024 edition of Conversations That Matter. For those of you who are new, welcome. And for those of you who are returning participants, welcome back. Each semester, the McGrath Institute hosts a series of conversations around a topic of relevance to the Catholic intellectual tradition and pastoral life. In 2022, the USCCB announced plans for the Eucharistic revival, which will culminate in the pilgrimage later this summer, when Catholics from around the country will gather in Indianapolis for a Eucharistic Congress. In light of the upcoming Congress, this spring series will discuss the effects or fruits of the real presence of Christ in the Eucharist. For in the words of Pope Benedict, a Eucharist which does not pass over into the concrete practice of love is intrinsically fragmented. The spring series will include this conversa conversation and a second conversation in April. And now it is my pleasure to introduce the host of our series this semester, Michael Baxter. Michael Baxter joins the McGrath Institute as a visiting associate professor. He currently teaches at Regis University in Denver, Colorado. He has also held teaching appointments at DePaul University, the University of Dayton, and University of Notre Dame. Michael Baxter was a co-founder of Andre House in Phoenix and the Peter Claver Catholic Worker in South Bend. He is currently a board member of the Tamarindo Foundation in support of village-based social projects in El Salvador. Michael Baxter, I'll let you take it away. Uh, thank you very much. Um, it's good to have everyone here. And we have, uh, as well as, um, me, we have three uh, people who will be speaking with us and discussing, um, having conversation about the Eucharist and Catholic social teaching. Uh, first, there's Professor Jennifer uh, Newsom Martin, who's a Catholic um, systematic theologian at the University of Notre Dame with joint appointments in the Department of Theology, as well as the Program of Liberal Studies, and is the uh, author of Hans Urs von Balthasar and the Critical Appropriation of Russian Religious Thought, which won an important award um, for theological promise in 2017. Secondly, we have Professor Emmanuel Katangale, who's a Catholic priest from the Archdiocese of Kampala in Uganda and a professor of theology and peace studies at the University of Notre Dame. He also has an appointment in the Keough School of Global Affairs and the Kroc Institute for International Peace Studies, as well as a um, appointment in theology and peace studies. And he is the author of 10 books. Most recently, Who Are My People? Love, Violence, and Christianity in Sub-Saharan Africa. And our third uh, participant is Professor William Cavanaugh, who is a professor of Catholic studies uh, at DePaul University and a director there of the Center for World Catholicism and Intercultural Theology, is the author of nine books, most recently just out um, from Oxford University Press, The Uses of Idolatry. So I wanna thank these three uh, people for coming to um, our, our um, conversation today. And the conversation is on the Eucharist and its implications for Catholic social teaching. In the context of the Eucharistic revival, we have the church in the United States underscoring the importance of the real presence and the importance of Eucharistic devotion, central feature of Catholic life, the source and summit of the life of the church. And one of the fruits of uh, the Eucharist, which is set forth in the catechism, is that the Eucharist... Um, commits us to the poor. And uh, we wanna talk about that commitment to the poor and more broadly, the, our commitment to Catholic social teaching in order to stress the link, the interconnection between Eucharistic piety and devotion and celebration and the command that we all have to uh, infuse the social order with, um, with our beliefs. And so it's in that spirit that we have this conversation Today and historically in the Catholic Church over the last 60 years or so, there really has been something of a divide between those who are interested in the liturgy 
on the one hand, and then those who seem more committed and interested uh, in social justice on the other hand, as if they, these were two separate entities. And what we find ourselves reflecting on is the fact that actually they're intrinsically connected. And uh, we want to underscore that link between uh, the Eucharist and Catholic social teaching in our conversation today. So that's the direction and the orientation that we'll be stressing. Um, and uh, I'm going to ask Jenny Martin, we're going to be, be informal here. Jenny Martin, um, Professor Martin, will you uh, tell us what you think about this, this connection between the Eucharist and Catholic social teaching, and uh, how should we think about this? Get us started. Thank you so much for that question. I'm so delighted to be here with all of you. Thank you for coming to the webinar. Um, I think I, just as I was listening to you describe the sort of diagnosis of the problem, um, I couldn't help but think it seems like um, this kind of divide, this artificial divide is really symptomatic of it seems like a broader modern tendency to want to fragment and separate rather than to see all of the Catholic doctrines and practices as really inherently integrated and mutually implicating. So I think um, when the celebration of the Eucharist is separated, not only from um, our obligation to the poor and our honor to give to the poor, uh, but also from these broader dogmatic claims about the nature of God as Trinity, about Christology, about pneumatology, the Holy Spirit, um, it can sometimes feel as if the Eucharist is something that we do, something that we show up. It's a practice that we do. It's something maybe merely religious or social. Um, but I think uh, if we understand it within the context of these broader dogmatic claims, it's really um, something that we receive as a gift, right? If we understand it in terms of, of what's really going on in the liturgy and which in turn kind of prompts our own uh, turn to giving, right? I mean, I think to me, um, that's what's really helpful. I mean, I think someone like Baltazar is actually really helpful about uh, thinking about how some of these, these connections are made, um, how our dogma connects with our Eucharist, which connects with our actual praxis and Catholic social teaching. I could say more about Balthazar if you'd like, yeah. Yeah, say so a little more about Balthazar and why you find him so important and Absolutely. help. Absolutely, yes. Um, well, he's not, you know, really the, maybe the first person um, that comes to mind when you think about sacramental theologians. Um, but, you know, as many of you know, there's this really wonderful book recently came out with Notre Dame Press in 2022 by Jonathan Sorallo called The Eucharistic Form of God. And he really kind of collects a lot of Balthazar's Eucharistic theology in one place and really helps us to see exactly what the contribution is. So, I mean, for me, um, he, Balthazar really, he comes up with this idea called existential sacramental theology, which I think is what it's what he's wanting to do is to bring together all of the things that you've kind of lamented uh, have been separated. Um, and it's really operating at two different levels. Um, the first is really more speculative about the nature of God as self-giving, as surrendering about the nature of, of Christ and the way that Christ becomes um, communicable uh, in the passion and in the Eucharist uh, and given over to us. And then the second is um, at the other level has to do with the implications of this for ordinary Christian living. And so really all of it is connected with the fundamental motivating idea in Balthazar that um, the very character of God is self-gift and self-communication and surrender and self-abandonment, right? I mean, this is the Eucharistic logic at the at the source. Um, and so for Balthazar, it's actually kind of a very striking um, turn of phrase where he says that the Eucharist is God in the form of his givenness. So in all of these forms, even before we get to mass, right, it's God in the form of his givenness. The father gives himself to the son and to the spirit in these mutual relations of um, kenosis. And then we can kind of come and participate in that. Um, and so that really the our response to all of the self gift um, obliges us to return with more gift, right? So we become we become participants in in the Trinity, when we give uh, ourselves to other people, so there's no, there is no divide, right? It's all the same logic. It's all the same kind of um, obedience to this pattern of of the Eucharist, which is cosmic, which is trinitarian, which is christological, pneumatological, 
and has to do with how we are sort of treat other people and uh, the porosity of ourselves when we um, when we extend ourselves for others, right? Um, so it's it's actually a lovely idea. There's one line um, that I think is really lovely um, from Jonathan's book. I just was going to read it to you. Um, he says, the Eucharistic Christ causes those who receive him to become Eucharistic themselves. Christ's body itself dissolved is now a dissolving agent, right? And so then we can sort of turn ourselves toward toward the poor. Um, of course, this is picked up in Pope Benedict as well, um, you know, in Days so, Cantathest. So this idea then that <clears throat> as Christ pours himself out to us, we then get the power somehow, <clears throat> the grace, uh, the capacity to pour ourselves out toward others. Yeah, I mean, it's like, it's nothing other, I think, than what Augustine said in De Trinitate, right? I mean, it's not an innovation, like a Balthasarian innovation. I mean, Augustine says, we love our brother and we know the love that we love our brother with. And that is that is the love of God, right? It's not, we're not making kind of competitive choices between our right. liturgical practice. Right, exactly. So it's almost as if God acts upon us, which enables us to act in and for others, um, almost making it natural or of a second nature. Yes, and that's the crucial point, I think, because it can't be thought of as this extrinsic relationship between the Eucharist and ethics, right? It has to be an intrinsic, sort of internally related uh, connection. It has to be this natural connection. It can't be something that we sort of feel obligated to do sort of as an alien imposition, uh, but it's, it's all participating in the same um, love. So I, I think you're absolutely, that's, that's so, what Balthazar would say. I, I like this idea of um, the phrase, a way of life. If there's a way of life that comes with the Eucharist rather than a set of commands or obligations. And um, so this is really an important uh, uh, comprehensive idea and vision Balthazar has of the whole cosmos, the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit. But but then you th uh, it makes me think. All right, so then how does this how does this cash out on the local level? People people have uh, questions about how am I to live? What what should I do? What does this maybe another way to put it? What does this look like mm -hmm. when we uh, when it when it's working the way people like Balthazar? says it works when the Eucharist has this power in our lives what does it look like and I'm going to ask Bill Kavanaugh to 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 help us with this because he knows what it looks like I think um we've talked about that. <laughs> uh yeah I mean I think I've seen it a few times uh in my life uh I hope so anyway yeah I mean I'm I'm struck by Jenny you mentioned uh Augustine in uh, De Trinitate in in the confessions he talks about he uh, God God says um you know eat I am the food of the fully grown eat of this and you won't assimilate me to your body like the food that you eat but but you'll be assimilated to me um and there's this wonderful sort of messing with the boundaries between me and you and God that happen in this Eucharist. And, and that seems to me to just come right out of, uh, you know, first, first Corinthians 12, where this whole image of the body of Christ is we're individual members that are each necessary. You know, the hand can't say to the foot, I don't need you and that that sort of thing. But at the same time, the boundaries, because we're all part of the same body, the boundaries are all kind of messed up. And, and he says that when one suffers, all suffer together. And when one rejoices, all rejoice together. And the, the members of the body with the, that seem the least honorable are, are clothed with the greatest honor and so on. Um, and so, and then you can bind that with Matthew 25, and it's Jesus saying, it was me that you visited in prison and clothed and, you know, gave food to and so on. And so there's all of this kind of boundary breaking amongst me and you and mine and yours and us and God. Um, and so uh, it, that's a, the, so the sense then that you can actually get in practice of the kind of breaking down of boundaries um, I mean, it, it, I'm thinking now um, my parish has this wonderful uh, 
um, migrant ministry going on where we've, you know, Chicago has been flooded with uh, Venezuelan migrants that um, many of whom have been bussed north by the governor of, of Texas. And so we have this crisis, you know, in the middle of the winter, all of these people that come without places to stay. So, so the, um, our parish has opened up uh, an extensive ministry in buildings that we uh, have not been using uh, to feed and clothe and house and provide medical care for uh, these newcomers. And there's this real sense, I think, in the community, I mean, it's really energized our parish a lot. And there's this real sense, I think, of that same kind of crossing over boundaries that you get in the Eucharist, that the difference between me and you, between the giver and the recipient, you know, you go and you feel like you've been ministered to by people who uh, have crossed the Darien Gap with, you know, two of their kids uh, and come thousands of miles. Um, you know, the 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 difference between between me and you sort of breaks down and the difference between mine and yours breaks down and you don't feel like you're providing a uh, service, but you feel like you're listening to stories and um, and and it's all kind of coming. What, what being a member of the body of Christ uh, means is kind of coming home in these sorts of uh, encounters. Um, yeah. I remember, you know, a friend of mine, Joe Corpore, he's a priest here at Notre Dame. He uh, told me once that he was working down on the border near McAllen, Texas, I think it is, uh, where Sister Norma ha is receiving all these uh, people coming over the border. And he talked to one father who said, me and my son, his one-year-old son, <clears throat> we came from Guatemala. And, and, and Joe Corpore said, how did you get here? And he said, we walked. I said, well, how did your son walk all that way? And and the father said, I carried him. <laughs> you know, and that just that, of course, a fa any father would do that. But that talk about blurring the boundaries and, and so on and taking on e each other's burdens. That's just a perfect example of it. And to be plugged in to that reality, big reality in our society today, somehow, Brings, brings us close to, I guess, maybe what Balthazar would say, the heart of the world. Mm. That this is where it's really being dramatized and and um, uh, uh, lived out in our society. And, and that the Eucharist somehow draws us toward that type of event um, in a very powerful way. Uh, last thing you would want to be is all by yourself after you know, um, an hour devotion to the Eucharist in adoration. That's the last thing you want to be. What you, it has this outward impulse. Yeah. Yeah. But you know what else I'm thinking, <clears throat> especially um, blurring the boundaries and the divisions. One way that the divisions and the boundaries get blurred is not just the boundaries between us and God and each other, but also of nature or creation and um uh i think uh emmanuel i think that you would uh have something to say about this with this your remarkable work in uganda and the reflections that it has um uh, generated in you about the connection between the eucharist and creation in documents such as laudato C si and elsewhere what do you have to what do you have to say about this wonderful uh, the invitation to be part of the conversation is uh, uh, indeed a great joy to be uh, part of the conversation. As Michael mentioned, I am participating in the work of uh, creation care, responding to the cry of the earth and the cry of the poor, working with young people in the rural diocese of Casanaruero, in programs of reforestation, uh, food, regenerative food, sustainability, and simple economic livelihood uh, means for, for, for the young people that are, are, are poor. Already being uh, inspired by the Pope's encyclical Laudato Si. And uh, this has drawn me deeper and deeper, not only into appreciating uh, the issues of uh, 
the connectedness between the cry of the earth and the cry of the poor, as the Pope Francis says, that the two of them go together, but also the, 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 the ways in which uh, we need integrated ways to think about this. It's just not one or the other, but integrated ways, which he calls integral ecology. And then when he kind of fleshes that out, he kind of talks about it as a spirituality, as a mindset, and a lifestyle. So he writing this beautiful uh, encyclical, Audato Si, reflecting on all that. And, but then towards the end of the encyclical, he comes to reflect, he's kind of winding down. On the, then he comes to reflect on the connection that he sees with the Trinity and then on the, with the Eucharist in paragraph 236, especially when he talks about uh, the Eucharist. There's a beautiful, uh, beautiful passage actually that kind of really uh, teases out uh, all these different connections. Uh, listen, for example, some of the expression that he uses that uh, uh, in the, in the Eucharist, all that is created finds its greatest exaltation in the Eucharist, which is uh, connected to, I think, what uh, Jenny was talking about to, for Bartos that the Eucharist God is the form of his givenness. Um, and then Pope Francis also said, the Eucharist is the living center of the universe, the overflowing core of love in exhaustible life. The Eucharist joins heaven and earth. It embraces and penetrates everything. So a very, very rich reflection really on the Eucharist that really establishes a very deep connection between the Eucharist and the care of creation out there. I, I think the way I'm reading this, uh, he's making uh, two points, really. The first one, um, that when we participate in the Eucharist, we are immediately drawn out of that into the care for God's creation. There is no way that we can participate in the creation, sorry, in the Eucharist without moving out. As he said again in that paragraph, um, that the Eucharist sends us forth into the world. It gives us energy, motivation, and, and a, a model. So th there is a movement from the Eucharist, really, that sends us into the world, into the care of creation. But I see in this reflection also uh, another claim that he's making, that there is another movement, in, in, in fact, uh, it's not only that the Eucharist sends us into the world, but the care for creation for the poor, because the cry of the earth and the cry of the poor go together, that that work actually is itself uh, an, a Eucharistic drama, that in of itself, that work itself uh, is Eucharist. Because in this paragraph, he says, the Eucharist is a spirituality which embraces and penetrates uh, e e everything. And when he talks about the Eucharist as the living center of, 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 the, of the union, I think he's making the claim that the Eucharist actually, sorry, the care for creation is a, is a Eucharistic table uh, that, 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 that right there in the care of creation, we are already participating in God's self-giving life to the world that we are already participating and therefore appreciating uh, this God's overabundant uh, love and care for God's creation. That we are participating in that flow, we are participating in that drama. And if that drama, again to use uh, what Jen says that uh, um, Bartholomew says, if that drama is God in the form of God's givenness, we see that already in, in, the, in the care for creation, working with creation. You can see that givenness every day in the, the seeds that are kind of growing, then they mature, then they die, and then they feed other organisms. And so that whole interconnectedness of givenness that is already going on uh, within, uh, uh, within creation. But that participating in that, that one already participates not only in this kind of form of givenness, but also in this sense of overflowing gratitude, that creation itself is kind of always singing 
uh, with a song of gratitude to, 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 to God, uh, singing a psalm or, or already, which is thanksgiving, which is Eucharistia, Eucharistian, to give thanks. This is already, or, 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 already Eucharist. Hmm. I can almost also make the claim that without actually that appreciation that comes through this kind of participation in, in that careful creation, without that, we will not even be well disposed to understand what we do when we come to the Eucharistic table, when the priest takes the bread and wine and says, blessed are you God of creation, through your goodness you have given us this bread to offer, uh, foot of the earth, work of human hands. Uh, that is just a climax of that thanksgiving that has already been recognized and uh, seen and participated in in the everyday work of creation as we participate within that drama of God's sake giving uh, love uh, to, to the world. So there is that deep, 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 deep connection uh, between uh, the Eucharist and the Eucharistic table uh, and the work of uh, creation care that is so dynamic and so uh, intimate that I, that I see that is going on. And that's person also what I'm beginning to appreciate more and more as I engage this work of creation care. Do you, you know, know if I say a quick thing, Michael? I just was so yeah, struck um, as he was talking. Um, I mean, it's uh, sometimes we sort of like um, are very concerned that we have to show that there's a connection between um, sort of the social, the Eucharist and the social. But as you were talking, Emmanuel, I just, you know, it's already, it's already social. It's always already social, right? I mean, we're always already participating in this, in this kind of uh, social life, right? The, the life of the Trinity, the life that is uh, in, in the creation, all this sort of mysterious life that is always sort of pulsing in all the natural world. I mean, we don't have to make it so it is already so it's just the way it is we just have to open our eyes to see uh you know that it's already social and so that the uh, the connection is actually much more natural than we might expect otherwise and it, and it is it is in fact it is in fact that participation that uh, uh social embeddedness that we are already in that uh, to the extent that it is filled with gratitude with giving thanks with appreciation of this kind of givenness it is that actually that in a way prepares us that forms us uh, to appreciate what we are doing at the Eucharistic table. Without that, I'm almost saying, we would have no clue of what is going on at the Eucharistic table, apart from just kind of saying words. The words just, just become kind of more uh, mere words. It's, 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 it's through this kind of rich, dynamic, social, or practical engagement with God's creation that we are prepared to appreciate what a true Eucharistic table. So the movement is not just from here, Eucharistic table to the world, but the movement is from <laughs> the world into the into the Eucharist, that, that kind of dynamic. Uh, right. As it says right in the mass, through, through your goodness, we have this bread and this wine to offer you. Yeah. So that, like Irenaeus points out, it's, it's really the stuff of creation that is worked up in the Eucharist uh, to become the reality of Christ among us. Um, uh, I like that seamless connection between creation, our own role in it, between uh, all of us. There's no disconnect. There's no absolute individualism. We're all somehow connected. This is um, something that's important for us to notice, I guess, is what you're saying. It's already there. We're not creating it. It's just gives us the eyes to see it. Um, I love it when, uh, you know, at a mass, you see all these different people coming up for communion. Uh, people who are in different political parties, people that are different sizes, different ages, um, all the different uh, people that are in the church get in the same communion line. And uh, in some way, maybe standing in communion in communion line, we acknowledge that we're all God's welfare recipients, that we're all receiving what God has to give us, and that we don't have anything truly that's ours that we haven't been given. So it's like what Jenny, you were saying, is that it almost becomes natural to repeat that dynamic uh, with those that we see um, uh, 
uh, in the world that that uh, that we want to uh, serve or be with or accompany. Um, any other thoughts here? Well, it, it seems to me that um, part of what's motivating the separation uh, is this is the fear that um, the more we talk about social justice and so on, that it becomes horizontal, right? That we we forget about God and it becomes secularized. I think that's the the fear of some people in the church that. Um, if you get away from talking about the presence of Christ in the Eucharist and Eucharistic adoration and start talking about what's going on in the world, that you're going to forget God and that it's going to become uh, it, just another kind of secular exercise in, um, you know, God forgetfulness, you know. Um, and, and there's a, I think there, there is a danger uh, in that, you know, we get, um, we, we sometimes forget when we think of the Eucharist as action uh, rather than presence, we sometimes think it's our action, you know, um, and and there is a danger to that. But it seems to me that, um, so that that's responding to a real fear, but the danger of that then becomes the sort of opposite that that the Eucharist becomes opiate for the for the masses and it never touches down you know, we we become hypocrites because it has no effect on our actual lives. We, we might be working for terrible corporations and doing terrible things Monday through Friday, but on Sunday we fool ourselves and and um, and come, you know, to to receive the the Eucharist in this way that doesn't have any any actual effect in the world. So trying to bridge that divide, it seems to me like somebody like Dorothy Day had a sense that. Um, uh, if God doesn't change the world, then it's not going to be changed, right? We we can't rely on our own efforts to do this. And so it's only through contact with God through the Eucharist and other means as well. It's only by relying entirely on God's grace that change in the world is is going to come about. Otherwise, we're just, we're we're lost, right? If we're if this becomes an exercise of uh, ethics, you know, or we're just kind of relying on our own uh, on our own effort. So it seems like there's um, both sides in this debate have legitimate fears or both sides of this div divide. We, it's not, hardly ever a debate. It's more just a divide. Both sides have legitimate fears that could be uh, addressed um, precisely by a true appreciation of what God is doing for us in the in the Eucharist. You mentioned Dorothy Day. I'm thinking, you know, um, one time in, in the long loneliness, she mentions how one time she walked into the church that was in their neighborhood on the Lower East Side, um, where they had their hospitality house uh, um, in New York and the found, foundation of the Catholic worker movement and so on. And she was looking for Peter Morin and she couldn't find him at any of the houses. So she went down the street to the church and she found him there um, sitting before the Eucharist, not mass, but he was just making a visit, as they used to say. And uh, and he was talking. <laughs> he was talking. <laughs> he was always talking. <laughs> he was talking. <laughs> and and he was and she and she could just hear him mumbling and, and muttering and you know, getting his plans and so on. Uh, and just uh, uh, this constant conversation with God. And for someone like Peter Morin to go out on the street, to step out of the doors of the church and to talk about social reconstruction made total sense to him. Hmm. A total sense. It was just, uh, if you are gods, you will have a an impulse that is intrinsically social hmm. if you're paying attention to God. Um, Another thought about about this very same thing, Dorothy Day at a particular moment in her life uh, at the outset of World War II had to decide what the Catholic worker stance would be during the Second World War. And they had been a pacifist movement up to that point. And uh, she had to write an editorial after the, um, Pearl Harbor and the uh, uh, Japanese bombing of Pearl Harbor in December of of 1941, and um, uh, and she writes the editorial, 
And if you read closely the editorial, she says, here I am sitting in this church asking you, capital Y, meaning God, what should I say? What should we do? We have 75,000 readers of the Catholic Worker. What do we say at this time of war and rumors of war? And she was writing this editorial in front of the tabernacle, um, asking God, you know, what can we say? And she finally says, you know, we are we are still pacifists. Our manifesto is the Sermon on the Mount. Um, <clears throat> but it made total sense to her to to think of the work of peace as beginning and really as being formed in the presence of the Eucharist. Um, uh, so for her, it was it was totally uh, seamless like that. Yeah. Daniel Berrigan told a story of uh, saying mass at the Catholic Worker House uh, in New York, and he had used a coffee mug for the chalice. And afterwards, one of the volunteers was going to wash it, and Dorothy Day took it and kissed it and buried it in the backyard. Yeah. That, that was That's because incredible. it had held the, the blood of Christ. Yeah, so, so there's this sense that we all have, I think, of the reverence of the Eucharist and uh, uh, of the precious body and blood of Christ. And um, it makes total sense to regard other people with equal reverence. That we should, that we should, uh, that 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 we really, it's totally natural to to simply hold other people's lives in our hands in the way that we hold the body and blood of Christ, the body of Christ in our hands, or we receive it in the tongue, and so on. Yeah, with but that there is comparable reverence. <clears throat> yeah, Emmanuel. There, there is something uh, within our context right now that is so, yeah, that goes against all that we have been saying about this deep social connection between the Eucharist. The Eucharist not only having social implication, the Eucharist is by nature social. But there is a tendency that has over the years that has created this gap. And my worry is that the more that that gap is not repair, the more then the Eucharist gets weaponized. It turns into this kind of neat spiritual weapon, actually. <laughs> and we, we see it in so many, so many ways that this center of the universe, this center of our unity, now becomes the, the, the source of actually of uh, marginalization, of excluding. Uh, I, I, I don't know what is going on. Uh, with that, but I, I'm concerned more. My own sense is that, of course, the more there is that divide between the, the social and the spiritual, the more the spiritual then gets weaponized. But I'm just curious from you gentlemen and lady, <laughs> what, what do you think about that, uh, that, that reality? Um, I, uh, when uh, Bill was talking about the, um, the, the precious blood in the coffee cup, I kept thinking about, um, so, you know, Balthazar is one of his very favorite poets is Peggy, and he's, he spends a lot of time, Charles Peggy, the French poet, and uh, he talks all the time about um, when, when Christ gives himself to be distributed in the Eucharist, um, he gives himself to the possibility of misuse and this weaponization that you're talking about. He, he has this long uh, bit about, um, about Simeon holding the infant body of Christ in his hands, you know, these old kind of wrinkled parchment hands. He's holding, you know, the creator of the universe in uh, his poor and withered and puckered up hands. Um, and then he makes the, the connection that similarly, the Eucharist is distributed into our sinful hands, right? And so, and, and I don't know, I, I feel very strongly um, what you're saying that there's, um, the Eucharist should, never be an instrument of um, weaponization and shouldn't be made political right I mean or, or politicized I mean it's I guess it's always it's always social it's always has to do with the polis but um, I think um, it's it's a testament I think to this self-abandonment I was talking about at the at the start that that Christ kind of places himself into our hands um, and what kind of uh, what astonishing kind of vulnerability and um, like power that, that, you know, we have, I, I don't know. I, I, I would love to hear what Bill has to say or some of the others as well, but um, I just the image of, of Christ's infant body in the hands of Simeon and then his Eucharistic body in our hands every Sunday. It's yeah. 
Yeah, I mean, you know, I, I wrote a book on torture and Eucharist in which I talked about the excommunication of torturers uh, under the military regime in Chile uh, by a group of bishops uh, there and eventually uh, by the whole bishops conference. Um, and defended the idea of excommunication uh, under those circumstances. Uh, and so uh, it's a it's a tough matter. I mean, on the one hand, um, you want to say th the situation in which you have torturers and the people they're torturing approaching the same Eucharistic table, um, you've got to speak a word of truth in that circumstance and say, this is not the Eucharist and this ought not. Uh, to be happening, um, but the but I, I've become a lot more cautious. I mean, uh, in other circumstances, because um, because of this kind of weaponization and politicization uh, of um, of the idea of excommunication, uh, especially in a context where you've got uh, elections, right? I mean, one of the things that made the Chilean case different was that uh, nobody was running for election. It was happening in the context where, you know, political parties had been banned and it was the uh, the church was the kind of last uh, institutional resistance to human rights abuses under the military regime. Um, and so nobody stood to, there, there was no one party that stood to gain by the bishop's uh, action in that case, whereas uh, in the U.S. it's it's quite different, and I'm I, I, I you know I need to be a lot more cautious than that. I mean I, I'm I'm generally of the view of, of being um, you know as welcoming uh, as possible to the Eucharistic table, um, but one of the things that when we recognize our divisions, we can kind of take the Eucharist more seriously too. When we recognize that we're not, uh, we're not all uh, approaching the same table uh, in the same way, and we can lament, uh, lament the the divisions uh, as well. But um, but the weapon weaponization of it, I think, is is a clear and present danger that I think we need to avoid. These are tough questions. Is it Eucharist, Eucharistic politics and who gets to come to communion, who should be barred to communion? These have been uh, election year issues now for more than 20 years. Yeah. It's probably going to continue. Um, I often think uh, I worry about people, you know, not just politicians and their particular views on pro-choice and what's and so on, but also like, I, you know, I, I live out in Colorado and um you know, there's good Catholics who are sitting in those missile silos, ready to turn the launch key on command. And I worry about that. And I feel like saying, you know, you guys need to think about this and uh, that there's so many different ways in which we could use the Eucharist as a challenge, or as maybe the Pope would say, a medicine to help us to recover and to see, to get our vision again. You know, um, uh, the practice of racial segregation and so on was, uh, you know, in Louisiana in the 50s, people were told they couldn't come to communion until they would integrate their schools and so on in certain parishes. So it really is a complicated issue, and it is some, something to be uh, cautious about. It, it it might help to think of excommunication not as kicking people out, but as an act of hospitality, telling them this is what you need to do. You've already broken communion, and this yeah. is what you need to do to come back in. Um, but of course, in practice, that's um, you know when when that's appropriate and when it's not is really really difficult. It is, and I I wish there'd be more conversations among bishops and theologians who take strong stands on these over dinner and for people to really talk as um, friends. I mean, isn't it the case that in some, when we are gathered in the Eucharist, we are declaring ourselves friends with each other and friends with God. That's how Aquinas defines charity as friendship with God. And in fact, he uses uh, in the gospel of John, um, the quote of Jesus where he says, I call, I no longer call you servants, but friends. 
and he, that's how he defines charity. Aquinas does in um, uh, uh, in the Summa Theologia, and and so that idea of friendship with God uh, issuing forth in charity uh, with each other at the same table. It's a challenge for all of us. Um, other thoughts? We have a lot of questions on the on the on the floor here. Yeah, why don't we go to some questions from the folks listening? All right, I'm gonna I'm gonna read I'm gonna read a question here. It says uh, a common trope is that it is with Vatican II that a new radical emphasis on social justice takes place. Even Catholic social teaching is a relatively modern phenomenon initiated by Pope Leo. Can you discuss how this tie between the Eucharist and Catholic social teaching can serve as a cipher for finding other instances of Catholic social and political thought in uh, in history? Um, well, one thing that occurs to me in answering this is the idea that um, uh, concern for social justice, you know, is a modern phenomenon. It's not not really the case. If you if you look back to the early uh, centuries of the church, it was um, it was the bishops who took on the obligation of being what Peter Brown calls governors of the poor in the fourth and fifth centuries, where bishops took on the role of caring for the poor. In fact, um, the early church in carrying out Jesus's command to love God and neighbor. Um, uh, really created a new category of person called the poor, to which Christians had an obligation uh, to to help and to be in connection with. And um, uh, in in the in the fourth and fifth century, the the first hospitals were formed. Uh, uh, um, the first public hospitals were formed out of this impulse that we have this connection between love of God and love of neighbor formulated by Jesus. And uh, so really there's a, there's a witness to the social teaching of the church from, from the start, from the start. Caritas is really built into the nature of the church. Go ahead, Jenny, you're about to say something. Oh, I was just going to say, as a former Protestant, of course, I'm going to go to Acts 2.42, right, where they, uh, they live together in the communal possessions and the breaking of bread and the prayers. Um, but like, you know, all things held in common around uh, this sort of very early group of, um, you know, the early church in Acts. And, and even um, in Deus Caritas S, I think Ratzinger um, talks about this, uh, where he says, um, you know, even though we can no longer kind of do this anymore, where we cannot like have the sort of material things in common, um, as maybe we did when the, the church movement was very small. Um, he does say there um, that within the community of believers, there can never be room for a poverty that denies anyone what is needed for a dignified life, right? I mean, so it's like the, the it, that is sort of continued through. Um, and I think Pope Benedict sort of traces it all the way from, you know, from the second chapter of Acts uh, to Days Caritas, as for sure, that, um, that the Eucharist has to be the starting point, the sort of engine for um, for theological anthropology, for questions of human dignity, um, and for questions of social justice. You know, what a great part of that encyclical Deus Caritas S is where um, Benedict underscores the fact that the very office of of the diaconate shows the commitment of of uh, uh, of the church to to care for the poor, um, right in um, uh, written into its uh, structures of authority and ordination. Um, deacons are set aside in order to practice love <laughs> and to care for those who need it. It's right there. And that's in Acts too. So, yeah, right. And even where he says the logos became food for us as love, right? I mean, and the deacon certainly like participate in that, um, in that sort of incarnational element. Yeah, I think this is a really important point to stress that this is not something new at all. It's something really quite, quite old. And I think that's what, uh, Henri de la Vaux, uh, uh work has so helpfully pointed out, you know, that um, he says that in the early church, the Eucharist was more of an action than a thing. Mm -hmm. And then he kind of traces how this gets inverted, you know, the terms the, that the, the church is the real body of Christ. Um, 
and the Eucharist is the the Eucharistic elements are the mystical body, and that gets eventually kind of reversed um, in the High Middle Ages, and then um, uh, gets you know increasingly the Eucharist just becomes this thing, um, and that gets sort of privatized. So it's really uh, goes all the way back, and you can look at some of the Eucharistic practices in the Middle Ages too. Um, you know, around war making, for example, the idea that you had to refrain from the Eucharist and do penance uh, if you shed blood in war indicates that there, you know, this is not the connection between the Eucharist and questions of war and peace and economics and so on is not at all new. Um, so re recovering the the you know deepest vein of the tradition of the church, I think, is is what we're what, what we're called to now. Emmanuel. Yes, sir. What do you have for us here? No, I was thinking about the connection that you are all making and kind of reflecting on the reality in Africa, where actually uh, many people uh, cannot uh, attend the Eucharist, participate in the Eucharist. Uh, part of it is because of the distances and so forth. So maybe once in two months, that's when the priest is able to, to come to the area and they celebrate the Eucharist. Um, so I think about the many congregations that are not able to receive, to, to, to participate in these Eucharistic uh, exercises every week where they are kind of Eucharistic uh, deserts. Uh, but how we can also help, and help them to kind of appreciate the kind of the, the, the overall Eucharistic tenure of their life in the everyday practices as, as, as well. But at the same time, I was also thinking about uh, the politics of the Eucharist and how the Eucharist is very uh, often used uh, rather than uh, inviting, receiving. And I like this beautiful expression that uh, Jenny has provided of, of Simeon, uh, is old, wrinkled, <laughs> dirty hands, kind of really holding this fragile, uh, God, yeah, but but many uh, there, there is a very heavy, many times also moralistic tone uh, to the Eucharist that actually uh, almost kind of pushes people away more than inviting them into this space of standing before God. So I'm, I'm just kind of having so many thoughts going on, but thinking more specifically about the reality in Africa and the many ways in which uh, the Eucharist uh, operates. Not, not as a, a space of welcome, of receiving, of gratitude, uh, but in, in many ways also a sense of uh, alienation. You know, we have a message from one of our listeners, and I just want to read it because it speaks to exactly this point. Um, I think there's a question here, but the question starts out with a really helpful statement. Uh, in homily 27 on 1 Corinthians, St. John Chrysostom says that the church exists for those divided to come together. He says that, he says, this is true of the Eucharistic liturgy and it shapes how we look at the poor. And then here's the question, can you address how the Eucharist and caring for the marginalized creates or expands the true nature of the churches, uh, the church as united? I'm going to give a I'll give a little story to ju just get this this idea going. I I was at I was at church um, a couple of weeks ago uh, in Denver and at St Elizabeth's Parish we have a soup kitchen and I was putting the soup on um, downstairs and it's Sunday morning it's before mass about eight thirty that nine o'clock mass is coming up and there were three or four people very devout in church praying obviously um, before mass. Um, in in devotion to the Eucharist. And it was very, very powerful how focused and quiet people were, maybe six or seven people scattered about the church. And then I said, well, okay, I'm going to go turn down the soup before mass starts. And uh, I left. And as I was leaving, there is a homeless guy in the back um, with his knapsack on, you know, and, and, you know, and his duffel bag and so on. And, uh, and there he was praying with everyone. And I thought, this is so perfect. 
of how the Eucharist brings everyone together apart from distinctions and so on. Um, and it, it just struck me how natural it was to, on the one hand, go to mass, to wait for communion, and then right after mass, to serve on a soup line. That 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 the dynamic is is the same. Is the same, mm -hmm. um, and it happens all over the world. All over the world. Mm -hmm. um, sometimes we overlook uh, uh, how much is being done out of the energy of the Eucharist um, and the activity of the Eucharist. Other thoughts. But just I was thinking, um, it also does a lot to um, disabuse us of the idea that the poor are is like a homogenous kind of category of you know them and then us, right? The I mean, outside, so, yeah. yeah, the outside. I mean, so I think that what you're saying really strikes me. I mean, I've uh, volunteered a bit, you know, teaching great books things at our Center for the Homeless, and uh, one of the things that's so powerful is um, talking about Antigone or Shakespeare, you know, around people who have no homes, but not giving them five dollars but saying, you know, what do you think? Do you think Antigone made the right choice when she buried her brother, right? I mean, so it, it's a mutuality. We're all sitting around the table together. And if if that can happen, talking about a Greek tragedy, it surely should happen when we're around the Eucharistic table, right? So there's not, the divisions aren't as present. Hmm. Hmm. Interesting. I'm reading some beautiful reflections in the, in the chat actually, yeah. Go ahead, read one, Emmanuel. Well, uh, Anonymous certainly, I love the idea of the Eucharist as the table and altar that we approach to practice the united social fabric that we seek in the mystical body of Christ. I think many Catholics are struggling with why they should commit to being Catholic and, in quotation, going to church because they struggle to live, in a, to live the Eucharist in their life outside Mass. The Eucharist each Sunday doesn't really make a difference for the rest of the 167 hours of the week look like. Instead of the Eucharist being truly the source and summit of our life, the first principle of givenness and thanksgiving and unity from which the rest of our lives stem from, we try to live out the Eucharist in pre-existing cultures whose goals are antithetical to the Eucharist. Is that sort of embeddedness in a culture what Catholicism are about? Or should this tension between what the rest of our lives are oriented toward and what the Eucharist is oriented toward be troubling for a Catholic? Hmm. Beautiful reflection and question. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. And I think- I, I'm sorry, go ahead. Yeah, go please. Ahead. I was just going to say, I think the uh, the practice of adoration certainly like is a is a chastening of um, of what the culture is saying to produce, 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 do this. But here we are just simply receiving. I think there's something really powerful about. I feel that tension, and I think it's a, a salutary tension. Sorry, Bill. <laughs> yeah. Oh no. Th um, thank you. Yeah. I, I mean, just to piggyback on that, I guess um, the question about uh, this troubling tension with the rest of our lives. You know, even if we're uh, serving the poor, uh, but we're not asking why are people poor, um, then it's not a complete Eucharist, you know, if we're, I mean, there, there is a way of seeing Christ in the poor that it becomes another act of consumption, right, for our own spiritual lives, that we meet uh, uh, people uh, in dire situations and say, oh, I see Christ in you, um, but don't actually kind of um, address the larger situation of why people are in these dire straits uh, to begin with. Uh, it becomes another uh, kind of ornament for our, our, for our spiritual lives, uh, and that ought to trouble us, I think, really, really deeply. You know, uh, maybe one thought to close on, <clears throat> it uh, connects with what Jenny was saying about adoration and some of what Bill is starting to say. Um, that we need to think of the Eucharist not just as um, uh, the body and blood of Christ, the body, blood, soul, and divinity of Christ, but also in the way we set it aside an entire day as God's day, the Lord's day. Um, in many ways, that cultivates the kind of um, 
attitude of reception of receiving a gift that um that we're called to um uh in the eucharist that we have a certain receptivity and if we set aside a day in order to receive what god has to give us um and set aside our work that that kind of disposes us to get the proper horizon to see what's really going on in the world um uh it, it should kind of perfect our vision of uh of of our lives and where we're heading so there's this kind of eschatological uh um or eternal dimension to the eucharist that um frees us to to do the kind of things that we're we're talking about here um but you know what uh we've gone on for one hour and two minutes so uh we're supposed to um stop at this point but um i really want to thank you all for um uh, uh uh jenny and bill and emmanuel for um uh for giving us uh so much to think about i want to thank everyone who's tuned in uh uh for tuning in and for listening with us and um we hope continuing this conversation we hope that we have helped to uh enhance and continue the conversation that all of us are called to be in as in this year of eucharistic revival um let's pray that it's a fruitful revival and that one of the fruits is our increased and deepened commitment to the poor so um for that um, I want to thank you all. It's certainly gotten me thinking a lot. And um, I'm sorry, all you out there whose questions were not answered, but if you contact us, we'll try to answer them. We have another conversation in the middle of April coming up. And the same topic, emphasizing a little more community building and Eucharistic culture. Uh, but for now, we, uh, we want to thank you all for coming in. And again, thank you, uh, Jenny, Bill, and Emmanuel for this thank wonderful you. Thanks, Mike. Thanks, everybody. Thank you, everybody. Have a good day.